G'day, I'm Steve Menzies. Welcome back to part two of the series of Arco and Zorba. In this episode, we delve into Arco's amazing career and how he became renowned as the godfather of Manly. I very rarely have seen you agitated, disappointed, but in 1976, after starring in his third premiership grand final victory, Bob Fulton left the club for eastern suburbs. The peninsula was in mourning. How did that happen? Well, you know, I can I can remember it distinctly. I mean, <laughs> I think we both cried, Boz and I, but uh, he, uh, <clears throat> it, it was a, a huge offer. I, uh, Terry Packer was behind that and uh, and uh, the, the money there was and, and even at the last moment I could have held on to Bob for a, for a lot less money than uh, than he got from Eastern suburbs but by that time uh, it had become common knowledge that he was definitely going and uh, because of the money that he'd been offered and uh, and he had a young family and he did and I can appreciate it and uh, you know he, 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 I, I could have hung on, but look, but look, I, I, I knew myself that just if I had a, for the small amount of money involved, no one would have believed it, and all of the players would have thought that they'd been, you know, left behind and, and, and not been included. So, I, uh, sadly enough, I, uh, I had to, you know, go along with the fact that he was going to eastern suburbs, but. I can remember when he lived where we, uh, oh, it was terrible. <laughs> we yeah, both I, really I, cried after I, that. I remember it very, very yeah. clearly. Many said Manly wouldn't win another premiership without Fulton, but just two years later, under former player Frank Stanton, yeah. Manly claimed his fourth premiership in just seven years, and yeah. it was one of the most courageous victories, something like six games in. 23 days, yeah. including a grand final 16 yeah. nil replay against yeah. Cronulla. It was incredible to see. Well, you know, there was that many injuries on in that team. I, I, I sometimes, I, I, I can't believe how they got on the field for that grand final. Some of them, they were, uh, you know, they were really battered and knocked about, but uh, they rose to the occasion and uh, they were they a were really tough and great side. They really were. In 78... You had an ex-local junior player as coach, Frank Stanton, yeah. who was a kangaroo, yep. uh, another another local product that played for Australia. And, look, may I just say this, Frank Stanton is one of the best coaches that I've ever been involved in in the game and uh, his record in England justifies that. I mean, he was the first coach, I think, with the team uh, to go to England to go through undefeated. Mm. And the captain of Manly was none other than Max Krillich, who became captain of... The Kangaroos. That's right. And another local junior. Um, you continue to guide Manly in the grand finals. And what is it, Ken, about Manly? It's Ron Willey, 72-73. Frank Stanton, 76-78. Bob Fulton, 87-96. Two wins each of those three local juniors that, or three players from Manly that, that coached Manly. And then Des Hasler, 08 and 011. The four four coaches that have had doubles. What is it about former Manly players being so successful in our club? Well, you know, the players that you've, you've just mentioned that were, were coaching that. Uh, they, they they just had that innate ability to to be able to handle coaching, and they were they were all uh, they were all great players in their own right. And uh, it, it, but not all great players make great coaches. Not necessarily, no. But they, but but they uh, they did make great coaches, and and you know uh, I, uh, I I encourage them to do that uh, to to go on with their coaching because uh, you know they. they they all they all had the ability to do it, and they proved that by uh, by justifying uh, every time they, uh, they they coach the top team. Okay, you continue to guide Manly 
in the grand finals in 1982 and 1983. But premierships, as we now know, are very difficult to achieve. Things have to go right with injuries. You have to come good at the right time. Um, there's a lot of things that go into winning a competition. And Manly found it hard to win its first one, but did it in a respectable 25 years. Um, but we learnt very quickly that they're difficult to win. Oh, they're very hard to win. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I honestly uh, I honestly thought uh, we were certain to win the 1983 competition. We'd, uh, we'd beaten Parramatta pretty convincingly uh, in, in the, throughout the season in the semi-final. But, uh, but to their everlasting credit, and, and I, look, I must say, I, uh, I've got great admiration for the Parramatta Club. They've produced some fantastic players over the years. And, um, and you know, whilst, uh, whilst you know, I, I was terribly disappointed we didn't win that competition because it was my last year with me, actually. Uh, but uh, in saying that, uh, Parramatta were, uh, were, were, were worthy winners and, uh, and, and I, I think, uh, you know, they... They, they certainly deserve to win that premiership. In 1984, you become executive chairman of the Australian Rugby League, the ARL. What an honour for you, your family and your beloved Manly Seagulls to have our leader as the leader of the game in Australia and eventually internationally. What gave you the impetus to do that, and and why did you think that you'd done enough at Manly, or was this another challenge? Well, I don't know. Some people have accused me of being a bit of a bossy boots <laughs> or something, but uh, whatever it was, I mean, uh, the people uh, involved that, that made that decision, um, that they felt that I was, uh, whether they were right or wrong or not, I don't know, but they, they felt that I was... Uh, the, the, the person that, that should be leading the, the charge. So, you know, they, they appointed me. You may have moved into Phillip Street in the city, but your heart never left the northern beaches, did it? Oh, and no. not to this day, it hasn't. No, look, really, and, and, and I made the undertaking that when I, uh, when I took over as, as, uh, as chairman of the New South Wales and Australian Rugby League, I made a, a, a promise to myself that Manly wouldn't be given any preferential treatment. And I swear on my word, during my time there, I made sure that they didn't get any preferential treatment. At the same time, I didn't think that they should, you know, be, 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 be hard done by because of uh, my position there. And, and that frequently happens, you know. Some people, I can remember uh, uh, the, the, the great halfback Holman, when, uh, when he was uh, coaching, he played with Western Suburbs, and when he coached Western, when he refereed against Western Suburbs, God, he used to give him a real tough time because I think he was so desperate to uh, to to, uh, to ensure that uh, he, he wasn't favouring West in any way, shape, or form, and, and he never did. You never hid the fact, though, that the Sea Eagles were your team, oh, even no. in charge of the game internationally in Australia. You. You never, ever wavered from absolutely cheering your side on. Oh, absolutely, and it's the same to this day. But but I, I give you my personal word that I ensured that they never got any preferential treatment and I, I, I made that statement very, very clear and, uh, and, uh, and, and I've got to be honest, they, they really didn't, not whilst I, not, not whilst I was there anyway. Well, really you're the most loyal person I think I've met. Um, and you, your word is your bond, and we're going to get into that as we delve into some rocky roads in your life as an administrator. Together with CEO John Quayle, you rebuild a fractured game to a point where it prospers and expands to a level in Australia and at an international level that it hadn't been at ever before. In 1986, the ARL become an incorporated body and you take on the dual role as president of the New South Wales Rugby League 
you are awarded an AM in 1988 for your services to rugby league, and the game just thrived under you and Quayle. What was it about John Quayle that attracted you to him, the chemistry between the two of you, the honesty with the media, the way you ran the game was a lesson for every other sport in the country. Yeah, well, I think John and I hopefully were a pretty good combination and uh, I, I, I've got the highest possible regard for John and uh, not, only, uh, <clears throat> not only was he a, a very good administrator, he, he's, a, he's a very good bloke too. And um, we, uh, we, we had a very successful time together and we were both, uh, we, we both really cared, cared about the game. And, 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 you know, and I think that was the, the major thing. And, and I think it was fair to say, well, it was a matter of fact that during, uh, during that time, uh, uh, you know, rugby league was the dominant uh, football code in the, in the country. I mean, you know, we even had the Australian rules and every other code on the back foot at that time. And, um, of course, um, that was... Um, then of course the Super League War came in, and well, let's you know, let's let's get to that. The Arco Quail leadership it it takes a working class game into a slick, thriving, sought after business. And in your book Arco My Game, you graphically describe the disastrous Super League Wars that tore the game apart in seasons ninety five, ninety six, and ninety seven. It was one of the most ruthless raids in Australian corporate history. And you, the little battler from Manly Boys High, take on men like Kerry Packer and Rupert Murdoch, and you never gave an inch. But how did you learn about what was going to happen? Well, all uh, Mr Murdoch wanted, of course, uh was to get paid television and, and uh, you know, at that stage, um, Kerry Packer had the rights and um, he, he wouldn't he wouldn't release them, of course, and uh, and uh, I, I think had he done so, I mean, he, he wasn't using it and I really tried to convince him to let uh, uh, Mr Murdoch have it, but uh, he, uh, he, he wouldn't do it at the time and... Um, and uh, I think had he done so, I doubt whether the Super League War would have ever eventuated. It made a lot of players millionaires and it broke up a lot of strong friendship Super League. I, I remember at the time. Let's get to one of your close mates and I recall, and this is one of the things that I want people to understand about you is your loyalty. You, you didn't always want to make the decision. You trusted people. And you put people in positions and you trusted them to do their job. I remember watching a schoolboy game, uh, Australian schoolboys, and I spotted a young kid from Taree called Malcolm Cochran. And I watched him play and he played hooker and he was outstanding. I phoned you and I said, Ken, I've seen a kid I think will be a good player for our, uh, our future. And you said, what's his name? Where's he from? And I told you, I said, Mal Cochran, he comes from Taree and he works in a sports store in Taree. You rang me back a half an hour later and said, we are booked to go to Taree tomorrow and let's go and sign Mal Cochran. I said, Ken, don't you want to see him play? You said, no, I trust you and I trust your judgment. We went to see Mal, I phoned him and made the appointment, and he was working at a sports store in town. And we walked into the sports store. You spoke to him for half an hour. You shook hands on a deal. And as we were walking out, <laughs> Peter Moore from Canterbury <laughs> was walking in. Yeah. And you said, come and have a cup of coffee. He's already gone. I've got him. And you were great mates with him at the time. Yeah. And you had this agreement where you wouldn't, you wouldn't sign anybody from – the Bulldogs, and they wouldn't sign anyone from us. But did that friendship break down when when Bulldogs went to 
went to uh, Super League? No, it's the one thing that didn't happen. I, I can't tell you how disappointed I was uh, that uh, the, the, the Canterbury Club went over to Super League. It, it, it really, it really knocked me uh, around badly because Peter and I uh, were, were always great friends. And, and I must say, even during that period, we still retained our friendship. And, um, but uh, it, it really, it really was a devastating blow for me that, uh, that Canterbury went across to uh, Would you? Would you shake hands with John Rebo today, who oh, who really started Super League? Yeah, and, I, and, and he was a former Manly player. Yeah, I would actually. Look, I I I always liked John Rebo, and I, I still do like John Rebo. John honestly thought that he was on the right track in what he was doing. I don't think he was, but he uh, I've I've always found him to be a good bloke, and uh, I, I've never been anything other than friendly with him, or even though I disagreed very much with him at that particular time. Okay. But uh, that, 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 was just, that was just a difference of opinion between he and I, that's all. Okay, just getting back to Mel Cochran, we were lucky, weren't we? He won a premiership with Manly oh, and he won a Rothmans medal. Well, you know, uh, on that, uh, I remember you telling me about him and I didn't tell you at the time, but I also looked up how he'd been <laughs> How he'd played the year before. He'd been away with the schoolboys team and was voted the best player in the uh, in the touring team. So I thought, well, not only with what Zorb has told me, it's been proven beyond any doubt. I'll go and try and grab hold of this player. And I tell you what, not only was he a great player for me, and Lee, uh, he, he was really a good bloke with it. Yeah, oh, absolutely, real good bloke. Ken, is it true you rejected? a $500,000 offer to jump to Super League during the height of the war over the game? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure of the amount of money, but it was uh, considerably a lot more than I, I was getting uh, as Australian uh, rugby league chairman. Yeah. No, it, it, it's true. I could have uh, I could have got a lot more money if I'd have, uh, you know, I'd have switched, but... Uh, it wasn't in yeah. you, was it? Oh, mate, I, I'd have been a very weak person if I'd have done that. Well, plenty of people jump. Oh, I'd have, I'd have the sign let, of a check. Oh, uh, but I'd have let a lot of people down if I did that. Oh. I'd, I, I, no, I couldn't, I couldn't have done that uh, under any circumstances. Your club, Manly, never hesitated to stand side by side with you. They were going nowhere, but with the ARL, uh, Kerry Packer, Optus backed, Group of the ARL. That must have made you proud. Yes, absolutely. Not a question no, asked. No, no, no. Was it to the detriment of Manly? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, I mean, the Super League War finished really, and I suppose what you could say was a draw because uh, you know it, uh, it, it, it uh, neither side really, uh, really really uh, had a had a, a total victory, I think. Uh, Could you believe the money that was spent? I mean, no, News Limited bankrolled Super oh, League it was, to the tune of $450 million. You know, Back in 1995, that's a lot of money. Oh, some of the things they did were, were, were below the belt, absolutely disgraceful. I, uh, uh, it really... I've never seen you so down and so stressed the deceit, the infighting, it almost destroyed you and it tore at the co core of your character, didn't it? Well, I, I, I must say that uh, I was very disappointed in some people during that period of time. But, uh, you know, I, I suppose um, it's like everything else. You, you, you've got to ride with the punches and you, you, you've got to get through all those things. And, and Has that been the most stressful time of your oh, career? far and away, yeah. I remember you away. took phone calls and you're yeah. a person that doesn't, sidestep issues. You right. answer calls, no matter who it is. You return calls to journalists, which is a rare trait in rugby league administration. You were hurt by a lot of people that were supposedly your friends mm. and you weren't bitter. You were disappointed, but you weren't bitter. Yeah, well, during that time, I, I probably rarely got home before midnight and I'd be back in the office by six next morning. And stressed. Yeah, very stressed. I, only because I, I was concerned about 
the, the good of the game. But what about your health? You ended up in hospital. Yeah, I, 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 I got these pains in the chest or something. And uh, anyway, I, I don't know. It must have. But anyway, I, I went to hospital for a couple of days, and uh, and uh, I, everything was okay. I, I got out again. You must have thought, thought you were back in parks at that time. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, it was it was a pretty tough time. But but anyway, look, we we got through it, and uh, and uh, you know. I, uh, well, you were 65, Ken, and you were eyeing, eyeing retirement yes. uh, when April the 1st, 1995, broke. I remember I was broadcasting a game at um, North Sydney Oval and the news came through that, um, uh, that Super League was starting another competition. Um, I at first thought it was an April Fool's joke, but it was far from a joke. Mm. Well, it was, yeah, it, it, it. I'd heard rumours of it, of course, but um, oh, you're, you're talking about the Super League. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, I was in England at the time and uh, and uh, Australia were ready to play a test match the, a few days later and uh, when I got news of it, I, I uh, immediately jumped in the plane and came home. I didn't stay for the test match uh, because I was that concerned about it. Uh, uh, I'd heard rumours that it was going to happen, but but uh, anyway, I uh, I jumped in the plane and came back, and uh, and of course uh, John Quayle and I, uh, together with support from a lot of a uh, lot of other good people, we did our best uh, in what we thought was for the best interest of the game. Packer and Murdoch ended up doing a deal. Um, yeah. Channel Nine would broadcast all Super League games. That was um, that was a bitter blow to you, and I remember I was in England at the time when that news came through to you, and mm. you couldn't believe that it had happened. You know, I'd had dealings and negotiations with Kerry Packer over probably the best part of twenty years, and and most of those deals were done on a handshake, and uh, and uh, we'd always kept our word with each other. But uh, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, you know. Uh, he made that decision to, uh, you know, to to, to go across uh, with, with Murdoch, and um, I must say, it, it, as a matter of fact, I, I, I can very much uh, recall uh, the circumstances. James James Packer rang me. Terry didn't. James rang me and said, uh, I can always remember his words. He said, um, I, I, I very much. Uh, doubt whether you'll be very happy with what I have to say. And, of course, then he went on and told me. I said, well, I'm not very happy and, and I expect you to honour uh, our financial agreement, which I did. Uh, but, um, yeah, so that, 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 that's how it all started. And uh, Carrie and I never spoke to him for oh, several years. And, uh, and uh, Ricky... Uh, uh, from Canberra, uh, Stewart. Ricky Stewart was coaching um, uh, the New South Wales team at the time, and uh, and uh, he invited uh, me to a to a dinner for them. And he'd also, unbeknownst to me, invited Kerry as well. And uh, anyway, when we arrived, he had us sitting next to each other. And anyway, of course, we shook hands and we. And on as a, I mean, what else can you do? It's uh, what's happened. Ken, happened. How, did, how did you feel with? Two of the biggest media magnates in the world, in the opposite corner, to the little battler from yeah. from over the bridge. Well, well, look, honestly, I uh, rugby league meant a lot more to me than either Gary Packer or, or Rupert Murdoch, and uh, I didn't wouldn't have cared who it was. I mean, I honestly thought that it was uh, the wrong thing by the game of rugby league, and uh, you know. I, uh, you know, I really do care about the game, and uh, I, I just thought, well, uh, you know, no matter who it is, I'm going to stand up for the rights of the game. So the same way you've always stuck up for Manly, you stuck up for the game. Oh, of course, yeah, I would, of course. Do you ever think back and think this club has been so much part of my life? You're now 91. Um, you 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 played for the club as a as a young man, Ken. I can't believe the passion 
you have for Manly. I mean, I love the club. It's it's next to my family, um, one of my greatest loves. And I know that you are more than that. Um, after every game, you agonise over it if they lose. You won't watch it on replay if they lose. You are agitated during the game. You stand up and cheer. <laughs> You've worn out the carpet in your home in front of the television from jumping up and down. Your wife, Barbara, can't control you. I've been you at, with you at games. Your arms go everywhere. You you are just the most passionate, manly person I have ever seen. <laughs> well, I can always remember Barbara saying to me once, uh, we, we live in Queensland now, of course, so I watch the games on television and so I can remember saying, don't use that language, the people in the other units will hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't. But but also where I sit in the lounge, the carpet is all scruffed up where I'm <laughs> I'm, run, I'm rubbing my feet and jumping yes. up and down on the... Yeah, or you'll go the, for a walk yeah. if the game's close. Oh, absolutely. You'll hop off down the south pool <laughs> and come back and Barbara's got to explain what's happened. <laughs> yeah, I've got it taped, of course, and... Uh, if she says, oh, they got up and won, well, I'll watch the tape. If they don't, I won't. Unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to leave discussions for this part of the series of Zorba and Arco. Please join us for episode three, where we continue this man's amazing story. <laughs> <laughs>